Okay, well, welcome to Reimagining Possibilities, Restoring Imagination and Nurturing Creativity. This is the first day of a three-day series, and we're excited to um, introduce ourselves, our team. Um, I'll hand it off to my colleague, Jeff. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jeff Austin. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I am a literacy consultant here at RISA, and I will turn it over to Roz. Hi everyone, I am Rosalind Shahid, and I'm also a literacy consultant here with Ryan Risa. Happy to be with you tonight. And last but not least, I'm Laura Gabrion, also a literacy consultant. Really excited to um, have the opportunity to work with you uh, today and hopefully across all three of our days. If we take a look at our agenda, at the bottom of the agenda, we've included a tiny URL and that will give you access to our slide deck. So we're going to you know, start with a little bit of music as a way to get us thinking about some joyful intersections in our own lives, but as well as ones that we can implement when we're in the classroom. Um, and we're going to talk about radical freedom dreaming. We're going to look at the disciplinary literacy essentials. We're going to think about how we can center joy in instruction and take a little bit of time to share ideas and reflect. So if we look at our working agreements, We'll think about um, just uh, demonstrating that mutual respect, taking a learner's stance, employing skillful listening, and engaging in humble inquiry. If there's one of those that you really want to work on today, we really want to focus on, go ahead and add that to the chat. Mine is always the same. Engage in hum humble inquiry. My dear friend, Dr. Shahid, gave me that um, few years back, and it's my favorite one. I always focus on that. Um, all right, we're going to think about our music, the music, the soundtracks of our lives. So we're going to consider that uh, walk-up song. Um, many, many of our athletes across uh, all kinds of sporting events have a walk-up song when they walk up to the plate or come onto the court, um, and they find inspiration from that, maybe you'll find inspiration from some of those. We've got Miguel Cabrera's, Matthew Boyd's, and um, Nick Matten. Uh, what I want you to do is just take a few minutes to choose a song that could serve as your introduction. It could, re you know, it could reflect on your personal or professional theme. And I want you to share that walkout song in the chat. That's I see you have some party people in the chat here <laughs> that's right <laughs> these make my heart happy black eyed peas let's get the party started yes i love it roar katie perry i'm walking on sunshine oh yes by katrina in the waves thank you for sharing these <laughs> oh. there's, there's some good ones in there um there are it's a great activity to do with students too, you know, just a way to get to know what's what's uh, kind of behind the scenes for that particular student. Absolutely. And sometimes what we do, what we've done in the past is we create an actual playlist using these songs. So if you choose to join us for day two and three, you might have access to this beautiful Spotify playlist. That's a uh, shout out to Spotify. <laughs> Thank you for sharing those. We're going to jump right in because we have a short time together. And we're starting with this quote by Audre Lorde. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength and service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. So today, during today's session, we really invite you to do um, what we're calling radical dreaming. Um, we know that after 2020, there was this call, this clarion call to reimagine, right? How we do school, how we interact with families, with communities, with one another, um, and how we really respond to and support children, most importantly. 
But after we returned to school, um, much of our radical dreaming was kind of a distilled idea. Um, and it's focused more on this idea of learning loss. So today, we really want to go back to that radical dreaming that we had at the uh, start of the 2020 school year, thinking about that idea and what Robin Kelly argues that dreams are central to our fight for justice and freedom. Without new visions, we risk a singular focus on skills rather than liberation. Um, and liberation or liberatory education is really what we believe is what we should be fighting for, right? Um, and so skills, when we focus on that, those discrete skills, that's a tool to help us achieve our greater purpose. So first, before we begin, we want you to drop into the chat very quickly. Uh, what do you teach? What do you teach? And um, when you think about what's possible in ELA and history and in the sciences or mathematics, what is that possibility? What is that dream space that you have? You don't have to drop that into the chat yet, but I want us to start thinking about that. So we have first grade teachers, kindergarten teachers, teachers of literature, peer-to-peer -peer architecture and drafting. These are beautiful, right? Um, and we know that when we engage with students in really beautiful ways, um, the possibilities are endless. So as we think today, um, whether you're a history teacher, I really want you to start to focus on the ways history serves to make us more complete, right? Um, if you are a English language arts teacher, I want you to think about the art part of English, right? How language serves us to be more um, empathetic, um, to be more uh, artistic, right? If you are a science teacher, I want you to think about that curiosity piece, right? Um, today, we had an opportunity to do some exploring in our own backyards. It was so beautiful, right? Just to take a moment to go out and examine the world as we know it, just after a rain, what happens to rain, right? Thinking about those pieces and how we can use those moments to build one wonderment in our classrooms. And so, and all of us will work collectively to be creative today, to think about how we might give access to the most underserved, underserved in our communities. And we're going to do that by first dreaming, engaging in that radical dreaming. And so what we'll do is look at a group of students and how they thought about that idea of radical dreaming. Thank you so much. Yes, please. I see that Leslie has already responded with this idea of empathy classes. Um, and any uh, things that you're thinking about um, as a first reaction to the video, please feel free to drop those into um, the chat. A few things that were stated that made me think is this idea. Uh, I think it was posted. I'm not sure if he articulated this through words, but he's, uh, I saw a picture that said, you are a hero of your own imagination. Um, and what is it the world that you want to live in, right? So you all just name briefly the courses that you te teach. So that is our little space of the world, right? Um, so as we go throughout today's session, we want you thinking about the subjects that you teach and what is your little piece of the world and how might you reimagine um, those pieces to do what it is that you want to make a, a beautiful space for your students. So we're going to do that work. And I think there's a few more things in the chat here. Let me take a look. We always talk about... Um, 
Yes, thank you. Love that we see the world through their individual visions or interpretations. Thank you for that. Yes. Um, we're going to take a look at emergent strategy. We're going to use the jam board to do that. So as we've been talking about um radical dreaming, um, Adrian Marie Brown has these principles, right? That are really, really beautiful. We have to thank our colleague, Jeff Austin, for sharing these principles with us. And I have fallen so in love with these principles. I've actually written, handwritten them, and I carry them with me. Um, and I find myself going back to these ideas over and over again because they affirm me. Um, they help me to stop myself when I'm overcorrecting, right? Um, and it helps to open up space for me to do some of that liberatory dreaming that we're talking about, to make safe spaces for kids, to make safe spaces, to talk with adults, to feel comfortable enough, right? To even bring up ideas that others might see as abstract. Um, and, and so what she, what she, um, what she does for us is provides an opportunity to use these principles as a goalpost and a guide for thinking about how we situate our classroom spaces. So I'm, we're going to invite you to go to the Jamboard and take a moment to read through these principles and just lift the principle that feels most important for you and your students as you move into the 2023-2024 school year. I think we'll need to use the post-it note and just read and just either write or paraphrase the principle that's uh, connecting most with you right now. I don't know why I'm getting so emotional, but they're so beautiful. Um, being rewritten, right? Um, it's something about the act of writing, writing what you believe to be important of importance and archiving those pieces so you can come back to them again, right? So um, some of the principles that are being lifted right now is small is good. So we don't have to go out and change the entire world. We want to do that at times. But if we can change our small section of the earth, our classroom starting there, right, could, is so absolutely important. Um, never a failure, always a lesson. Never a failure, always a lesson. We are growing. We are learning. We are practitioners. We must give ourselves grace to try new things, to grow, right? Um, less prep. We said this today, Jeff. Jeff and I were on a call today. Less, it was the best session. Less prep, more presence. When we're listeners, people feel that you're trustworthy, right? Um, people will share more and your relationships become more authentic, which is a basis for transformational work in the classroom. Um, trust the people. If you trust the people, the people will become trustworthy and move at the speed of trust. Thank you. Would anyone like to come off mute and just share something that's con that you're connecting with, or if you're already familiar with uh, Adrienne Marie Brown's work or how you're currently using it, anything that you feel is important to share. Okay. Um, Thank you. My number eight, less pre more presence. You know, I'm sitting here trying to get an idea of what I need to be doing this year. And there's so much preparation. I don't always have time to really be present in the moment with the students. Mm. So that's I look forward to uh, trying. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And it's sometimes it's those small snippets, it's those small conversations that transform the relationship. So thank you for elevating that, um, Ms. Paul. And as you're thinking about that, right, um, you know, how will you concretize that? Sometimes, like I said before, it may just be like a post-it note that I need to remind myself that it's okay to be in the moment right now, right? Anyone else want to share? 
Okay, it looks like we can go to our next slide. And I think my dear colleague, Laura, will take the lead. Hi, everyone. We wanted to, if you haven't been introduced to um, our Disciplinary Literacy Essentials document, we want to go through the 10 essential practices with you. We think that this document provides you with many different ways um, through which you can enact your radical freedom dreaming. It gives you obviously, you know, solid research-based, you know, instructional practices. But the nice thing about it is there in those bullets, a lot of different ideas. So we might be doing most of these things in the classroom, but it gives us some, you know, some concrete ways to get better at doing them. So let's just look at these practices. You can you can follow along in the document. I know Jeff put that into the chat for you, but we've got facilitating inquiry-based learning. So no matter what content area we're teaching within, we want to think about opportunities to get kids unpacking and answering big questions. Um, in ELA, it might be an essential question. Um, in science, it might be understanding a phenomena and how that, that looks um, in the world, how we would observe it and what, what determinations we can make about it. In history, we might be looking at um, understanding differences in sources, primary and secondary. But if we, if we give them a compelling reason to engage with the content, we, we feel like that will drive a unit. We also want to engage students in a wide range of texts. We want to give them the opportunity to think of text at, very broadly. Anything that conveys a message can be text. So text can be video, it can be a sign, it can be an image, it can be a book, it can be an article. Um, and we want to broaden that. And if you look at the document that uh, Jeff shared the link um, with you, towards the back is a glossary and you'll see the, the way that the Disciplinary Literacy Task Force defines text. Um, we want to teach students to read in the disciplines. So what does it mean when you're a mathematician? What are you reading? Um, you know, if it's something like a proof, which is a very condensed, uh, you know, statement, what, what's important to be paying attention to? Similarly, if you're in English language arts and you're looking at various elements of a story, maybe you're, you're wanting the students to pay attention to things like flashback or foreshadowing. Um, if we look at the next set, we've got um, teaching students to write in the disciplines and considering the, the way that disciplinarians in our field or in a field um, actually write. So what does a, a scientific report look like? Um, what do discussion-based questions look like when they're written out? Uh, we want to teach students to discuss and question complex texts. This is probably one foundational to all of this is uh, essential practice number one, and we're going to take a little time to dig into that today. But for sure, we think that conversation is such an important aspect of all of our classrooms. And that deep conversation, that deep and critical conversation can lead to better reading, writing, speaking, listening. Um, and that leads to the, the sixth uh, essential practice we want to design opportunities for students to speak and listen, things like presentations, but you want them to hone those listening skills as well. We know that listening is a lost art right now in today's society. So how can we equip our students to be good listeners when someone else has the floor? Um, critical listeners too. Uh, for our seventh in, uh, essential instructional practice, we want to think about Building vocabulary, I know vocabulary is critical to reading and writing, but we also think it's very important to build their conceptual knowledge. We've put a lot of time and effort as a, a, a group, uh, Dr. Shahid, Jeff, and, and I thinking about what in, in what ways can we build students' background knowledge because we know that's the, the, the key to opening that door to comprehension. We think assessment is important. We want to look at multiple ways that we can assess students. So not just those summative, but formative assessments, observational assessments as we're walking through a classroom, taking note of the conversations we're having with students. We want to also think about ways to facilitate community networking, to build opportunities into our 
curriculum into our, our lessons where students can connect outside of the walls of the classroom with issues and, and uh, problems that are occurring all around them. But that can also mean connecting them to people in the field who are doing the jobs that they might do someday. And then finally, we wanna think about opportunities for teaching meta-discursive awareness. That is just simply getting students to think about how fluid our language is. Um, you know, just getting them to think about words and how words in different contexts take on a whole um, new meanings. There's nuances to the, the ways that we use words. You probably even more with some of our students because they end up speaking in oftentimes languages. They use words in ways that we need to uh, better understand. So those are the 10 essential practices. One important thing, if you're familiar with the Literacy Essentials suite of documents um, in the pre-K, in the um, K through three, in the four or five, the mantra for these essential practices is every classroom, every child, every day. And in a self-contained classroom, it would be easy to embed all 10 essential practices. They're just slightly different than the ones you see here uh, for those, those early grade levels. But in the grades, uh, in grades six through 12, especially when our students are moving through our classrooms pretty quickly, uh, maybe, you know, 45, 50 minutes, we know that these 10 essentials, um, our goal is to embed them into instruction over a unit um, or maybe over the course of a quarter. Uh, because obviously, again, some of these you're going to use more than others, depending on the unit that you're teaching um, within each class period or across a week, for example. But some might need a little bit more uh, thought in regards to how you're going to integrate that into the unit you're teaching. So. What we want you to think about is what is your radical freedom dream for the coming school year? Just really what do you want your students to walk away with? What, what door do you want to unlock for them? How do you want them to see this world, your content area, a little bit differently? Just think about that for a minute. And then we're going to come back to the jam board. And in the Jamboard, you'll notice on the pages past those emergent strategies, you're going to see um, you're going to see essential practice number one, which again we see as foundational. And I want you to just look through it. So if you're English language arts, you'll be on frame two. If you're in mathematics, you'll be on frame three. If you're teaching social studies, you'll be on frame four. And if you're teaching um, science, you'll be on frame five. And what I just want you to think about is, is reading through those bullets, how might that, just giving students something to solve, how that might tap in to your radical freedom dream for the school year. And again, you can use sticky notes to add those thoughts. I'm beginning to see a theme centered on making things meaningful for students. This is wonderful. Yeah, definitely choice, another theme motivation, variety. I love this one. I'm dreaming of a classroom where students use language as activists, enact literate identities, supports my freedom dreaming here. That's beautiful. These are making my heart go pitter patter. Um, <laughs> I'm on the science frame. And it says, reimagine how inquiry-based science, often with failure, leads to true scientific discovery, right? Um, and it goes back to the emergent strategy, like never a failure, right? Always a lesson. This is especially important with so much misinformation on science issues. Yes, thank you for whoever wrote that. Um, and making a connection to a student's lived reality makes learning about scientific principles more meaningful. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love all of these. Um, I'm going to add to the chat. Um, it's Henry, Henry Ford. Um, the, they've got an educational hub, Henry Ford um, Museum in um, 
the habits of an innovator are so incredible. Um, it, it just really makes you think about what Roz just said is we often don't give kids the chance to fail. We don't give them the chance to kind of mull around in that productive struggle area. Um, but it's so important because they will actually not only surmount that and, and conquer that, but that gives them efficacy to keep going back at those types of tasks over and over. I have added that to the chat. Um, there's a lot of good resources there. Um, all right. So as you're kind of um, closing out this activity, um, you know, like we said, there's just so many that there, there's a definite set of themes here. Um, I see one in the uh, social studies frame, focusing on the positive in the community instead of spotlighting the negative. So that's a wonderful thing that maybe it's not solving a problem, but enhancing something that's already working well. Yes, definitely. Um, just the, the idea of getting students to do more of the outside of the box thinking, which is, again, such an important aspect of them being an innovator, a, 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 you know, a thinker, um, just not just taking things for the way that, uh, you know, maybe they expect us to have them answer for them to actually think um, and, and come up with their own ideas. These are wonderful. Um, all right, so I'm gonna pass this back uh, to Raz as we, as we begin our, our close out here. We're hoping that, that something in these essentials affirms that radical dream and it looks like you're connecting with essential practice number one, really thinking about a problem or a question that students can really dig into. Absolutely. So, um, and we position it this way, right? So when you feel affirmed, you'll try things. And also when you feel affirmed, you can say very concretely, here's why this work is important to be done in this way. So the essential practices, as Laura has already shared with us, really are a guide for us um, to be thinking about how our uh, content areas intersect, how they overlap, how they are in support of one another, but also these big ideas. So we said these 10 very quickly, but these 10 practices show up again and again in all the content areas, right? Um, so whether it's called problem-based or inquiry, we know that it's really important that we um, situate our content with questions that kids really want to explore. That in itself will make it much more meaningful, right? Um, that will support our goals around creating activists. It supports our goals around creating kids who really want to choose and, and um, be involved in something that's more meaningful than themselves, right? So what we want to do for the remainder of our time together is give you some resources to start exploring and thinking about, well, what is it in your particular content area that you want to, to do this school year that you've never done before? Or maybe you did do this thing before, right? But maybe you felt that you were so tied to mandates or so tied to the pacing that you thought maybe there's not room for this anymore. And what we're urging you to do is to go back to the things that you love, the things that bring you joy, right? Um, the dreams of students are alive and well, but if we focus solely on what we believe they've lost, we may miss another opportunity for transformation. Um, and this is from the book Street Data, which we love, right? And so we're thinking a lot about abundance. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with the NAP ministry, but I am so in love with that whole concept that we do our best thinking when we are well rested when we provide space to imagine and to be creative. And if we're on this constant pace, we really don't have those kinds of opportunities. So creating those spaces in our classroom, in our lesson planning, 
a a uh, an objective around how we're going to create spaces for students to be more innovative, more creative, more connected to one another. I think it's a beautiful thing, right? And it will serve us well because it will support all the other things that we want to happen, more reading, more writing, more of all these other kind of skill-based orientations, right? So um, Laura has put together uh, some resources for us. I'm going to allow her to kind of talk us through what some of these resources are, and then you'll have an opportunity to explore. And I know um, Jeff will put the actual links in for you. Um, it, it's, you know, linked to the, the words on the slide, but that's not going to help you very much. Well, I guess it probably would if, if you're in the um, if you're in the uh, slide deck, but um, at any rate, we've we've added some things that might stimulate some problem-based unit ideas for you. Uh, we've got the Resilient Educator uh, link, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. There's some big, big global problems that we might want our students to think about. I also linked for you the Disciplinary Literacy Resources Hub. When you click on that link, what you're going to see is there are folders for every content area. And in those content areas, you'll notice at the bottom, because these are set up in Google Spreadsheets, that um, you'll be able to find the essential practice. So we've been talking about essential practice number one today, and you'll be able to simply go to that tab at the bottom that says number one, and you'll be able to see all of the resources that we've collected for you around that particular essential. So if you're teaching English language arts, you'll see that there's an ELA folder. You'll go into that, you'll see the spreadsheet and you'll be able to um, work. I, I don't even think it's a separate folder. It might just be, may, maybe it's easier if I show. Um, Jeff, do you wanna just click on the disciplinary literacy resources hub? We'll just illustrate really quickly. Thank you. So you see the spreadsheets inside the folder. And if you're working with ELA, you'll you'll have a little um, stopping page at the front to, that'll just kind of give you the, the lowdown. But as you go to something like the tab along the bottom to essential practice number one, you'll see links to resources that will help you get at some of the learning that you'll want your students to do. So again, you see those sustainable um, you know, development goals, same, you know, same thing that we've linked for you, but this gives you a few others, gives you some ideas for uh, assignments, like you've got a, um, a little short article about um, identity um, and how important that is, but, but definitely it gives you a start if you're, if you're just simply thinking, where, where would I start to get this going in my classroom? And you can move through all of the essentials along the bottom. You can get it um, number two and three, which are, are centered on reading, um, four, which is writing, um, and you can move through. Uh, but one of the one of the nice things, like I said, is it gives you a few ideas. And I'm going to find while you're you're getting a little time to look at some of these your, yourselves. Um, we do also have a beyond the core document that gives you some resources for those of you who are not teaching across the four content areas, but you're teaching something like world languages or music. So I'll find that and um, put that link into the chat in just a minute. Another thing that you want to do is probably think about, you know, we're, we're kind of thinking about that joy and giving students choice. So we've been talking a little bit about ways to showcase student work. And so one of the ways is FLIP, which used to be called Flipgrid, or you can branch into podcasts, allowing students to report their findings in different ways. Um, and then finally, we added an article um, about inspiring awe, what makes a teacher memorable. The article explains that it's all about awe. Uh, it's just simply opening that, that mind to wonder, um, to discovery. So we're going to give you just a couple of minutes to click through those. And I, in the meantime, I'm going to find that beyond the core resource for you. So we want to give you a few more minutes to kind of explore on your own, but we know there's also power in uh, community. 
So we'll give you another minute or so, and then we will put you into a few breakout rooms so that you'll have a chance to share something that uh, you found interesting or maybe something you're thinking about and hopefully to get inspiration um, from your colleagues. Welcome back. We're just waiting for a couple more people. We've got some engaged talkers. Wonderful. So in our last two minutes, we would love to hear at least from a one or two groups, something you're thinking about, something that has inspired you, something you want to try out. So in our group, we talked about a couple of different things. Um, first, we talked about that in a lot of the articles that we looked at what makes a team memorable, we talked about basically when you were able to help students make connections. And that's what we found in the articles that we read. And we read two different articles. And then the second thing we talked about was um, inquiry and how that's important to drive um, student motivation and to just get them engaged. For that, Ms. Matley, anyone else want to share? I'm going to say, yeah, we also talked about how um, inquiry can be in, in this, not just one sort of for a sign of science, not inquiry in science, but also in, across, the, across the board, whether it's social studies, English, science, or, or even, uh, uh, even mathematics. Because, and we also talked about how we can even possibly even turn the learning target into a question. From time yes. to time. Just let them think outside the box, you know. Yeah. I love that idea. And really that is the that is the the point of the document and the essential practices is that we need to be more integrated in our thinking and cross-disciplinary. Everything creates a space for um, curiosity, right? We want to use that curiosity no matter what the subject area is. So we're right at four o'clock. We want to honor your time. We want to thank you. We want to encourage you to come back. We have a um, year-long series called Equity-Based Disciplinary Literacies. And we would love to have educators like you engaged in that work. You are fantastic. We appreciate you. We are also have session number two next week. And so uh, we encourage you to come back uh, next week on the 22nd. I'll be here. Jeff will be here. Laura will be someplace fantastic. <laughs> Um, but we hope that you are able to join us next week as well as we continue to unpack what it means to be joyful in secondary spaces. Have a great afternoon.